it's a, the perfect place for such a festival really no doubt there are other good places too but uh, here we have the house where Dylan Thomas' wife was uh, brought up for a time um, and so a place which was for him legendary in a way um, I think it's very good to take time um, to read poetry and to appreciate things that um, we usually can't find enough time for in our daily lives so here in the setting of uh, in his time and then the Falls Hotel here, we have a weekend where we can we can appreciate um, appreciate poetry, the poetry of Dylan Thomas, um, good company and uh, and pleasant surroundings. Mm. The influence of Welsh on the idiom of Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas was brought up in a bilingual con country, in a bilingual town, in a bilingual house in Cumdonkin Drive, Swansea, Wales, during the second and third decades of the 20th century. Newcomers to Swansea from Dyved in the largely rural West, both his parents were native Welsh speakers and furthermore were active in Welsh-speaking cultural circles in Swansea. As a child, as a boy, as a youth, at home, on the streets of Swansea and in the Welsh-speaking community in Carmarthenshire where during his early years he spent his summer holidays, Dylan Thomas heard the Welsh language spoken around him and was familiar with the sounds, rhythm and intonation of the language. In his writing, there are occasional glimpses of encounters with the language. In the short story, A Visit to Grandpa's, for example, he writes, He hurried indoors and I heard him talking in Welsh and he came out again with his white coat on. But did Dylan Thomas speak Welsh? No. Why not? because his parents elected to raise him in English, the language of the future. In the town of Swansea, as the poet was growing up, four worlds converged to form the environment in which he lived and began to write. The southern Welsh coast from Milford Haven to the Gower Peninsula to Swansea town and further east belonged to a territory that also includes the coastal areas of West Somerset and Devon in England. That splendidly ugly sea town, he writes in Reminiscences of a Childhood, where with friends I used to dawdle on half holidays along the bent and Devon facing seashore hoping for corpses or gold watches. <laughs> Devon, Somerset, Glamorgan and Pembroke together form an arc whose central point is the Severn estuary that widens to form the Bristol Channel. For centuries before the modern day, and in times as distant as the 12th century, when Flemish settlers on an initiative from Henry I came to live in Pembrokeshire, southern strips of Wales, including the area where Swansea was built, had been non-Welsh speaking. Another world Swansea and its people found themselves part of was modern Britain, a land at war when Dylan was a child. In reminiscences of a childhood, he writes of a country called the Front, from which many of our neighbours never came back. In the early 20th century, with the rise of the labour movement and the royal patriotism aroused by uniform and gun, Wales was pulled ever tighter into the orbit of London and its British discourse. Swansea, a major port and part of a maritime network that spanned the globe, had recourse too to places further afield. In Dylan's time, it had for many generations already been a place where the world moored and stepped onto the quay. In the 19th century, sailors and ships from far afield descended on the town, bringing with them their various tongues and influences. Towards the middle of the 20th century, Swansea, as were other cities, was exposed to new global influences. American cinema, for example. In the poem, Our Eunuch Dreams, Dylan writes, they dance between their arc lamps and our skull impose their shots, throwing the night away. We search the show of shadows, kiss or kill, flavoured of celluloid, give love the lie. Yet another world, Welsh speaking, began at the lower end of the Tawe Valley, 
in villages like Triboth, scarcely three miles from the Devon-facing seashore. From there, northward to Estella Vera, in this valley, as in all the other narrow, isolated valleys of Glamorganshire, there was a strange Wales, writes Dillan, coal-pitted, mountained, river-run, full, so far as I knew, of choirs and sheep and storybook tall hats, moved about its business, which was none of mine. In this passage, we learn several things. The fact that this Wales lay beyond the poet's ken, the fact that he acknowledges this unfamiliarity, and the fact that he felt no great desire to investigate this other Wales, close yet distant. We have seen above how Swansea, with its rich and varied cultures, offered the mind of a young prodigy much to feed on. The question we are required to deal with here has to do with the possible influence of one strand of that culture, the Welsh language, on one aspect of Dylan's work, his idiom, his style, his prosody. First, it should be stated that writing in English in Wales, while not a novelty in the early 20th century, was still something more of an isolated pursuit than an act part of any coherent tradition. What little English was spoken in Wales until the 19th and 20th centuries was largely the language of administration and of an anglicised aristocracy. English as a widespread cultural community language and as a dominant literary language was still in its infancy in Wales in Dillon's day. In his writing, we quickly sense that the poet is conscious both of the primacy of language in his world and of the non-alignment of his own idiom with other ways of writing and talking. In the poem, Out of a War of Wits, he writes, Out of a war of wits, when folly of words was the world's to me, and syllables fell hard as whips on an old wound, my brain came crying into the fresh light, called for the confessor, but there was none to purge after the wits fight, and I was struck dumb by the sun. In the poem, especially when the October wind, he writes as follows. By the sea's side, hearing the noise of birds, hearing the raven cough in winter sticks, my busy heart, who shudders as she talks, sheds the syllabic blood and drains her words. And in The Corn Blows From Side to Side, he coins the phrase, my continent of strange speech. These remarks and introduction have led us to the simple question, did the Welsh language influence the work and idiom of Dylan Thomas, and if so, how? Several things are clear. Firstly, in the poet's work, borrowing of Welsh words is very rare. In no poem does he speak more explicitly of Wales and Welsh than in prologue. But in this poem, there is only one Welsh word, brin, in its plural form, brins or hills. Secondly, the syntax of Dylan Thomas's work is untouched by a Welsh substratum. The syntax is English. Thomas does not write in the rugged southern Welsh idiom of rugby players, washerwomen, publicans or postmen. From a syntactic point of view, he writes literary English. However, in the context of the present paper, a third aspect of the language of Dylan Thomas requires much closer attention. This is a matter of style in a very broad sense, and more specifically has to do with the rhythms and sound patterns of lines that typify the writing of the poet. Presently, we may look for Welsh influence, not in the lexicon or syntax of the corpus, but in a field that includes intonation and the frequency with which given sounds occur in the language two things which, taken together, we may call here loosely phono, phono syntax. First, however, to establish a framework in which to conduct our work, we introduce the idea of the heterotopy, a concept elaborated in the work of Michel Foucault, 
in the late mid-20th century. Foucault writes, and I'll give you the original in French because I know some of you speak French, and then I'll translate it. Il y a d'abord les utopies. Les utopies, ce sont les emplacements sans lieu réel. Ce sont les emplacements qui entretiennent avec l'espace réel de la société un rapport général d'analogie directe ou inversée. Il y a également des lieux que l'on peut trouver à l'intérieur de la culture où tout est à la fois représenté, contesté et inversé. Ces lieux, je les appellerai par opposition aux utopies, les hétérotopies. On the one hand, there is the utopia. The utopia is a place with no real location. It represents society in a perfected form or in an inverted form. There also exists, probably in every culture, counter sites where all other real locations are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. These I shall call, by way of contrast to the utopia, the heterotopia. Foucault comments then <clears throat> on the relationship between language and heterotopia. He says, utopias offer consolation. Although they have no real locality, there is nevertheless a fantastic, untroubled region in which they are able to unfold. Heterotopias are disturbing, probably because they secretly undermine language, because they make it impossible to name this and that, because they shall chatter or tangle common names, because they destroy syntax in advance, and not only the syntax with which we construct sentences, but also that less apparent syntax which causes words and things to hold together. This is why utopias permit fable and discourse. Heterotopias desiccate speech, stop words in their tracks, contest the very possibility of grammar at its source. Foucault enumerates six principles that define the heterotopy, heterotopia. The third reads as follows. L'heterotopie a le pouvoir de juxtaposer en un seul lieu réel plusieurs espaces, plusieurs emplacements qui sont en eux-mêmes incompatibles. The heterotopia enables the juxtaposition within a single real location of several spaces, several sites that are inherently incompatible. So, just as in the painting of Van Gogh, where the tree, the field, the woman, and the church bleed and fuse to form one meta-object, in the work of Dylan Thomas, time, prenatal and time since birth, mindscape and landscape, proximity and distance, language and sound, English and Welsh, all fuse together to feed the Dylanesque vision of the relationship between man and the universe. The poem, The Corn Blows from Side to Side, reminding us of Field of Corn by Van Gogh, is an excellent illustration of these things, he writes. The corn blows from side to side lightly, tenuous yellow forest that it is, and bears the steady wind on its head, brushing my two hands. The flower under the soil rounds its ungainly roots, blue flower, in my continent of strange speech, divide and allow the path of my warm arm to touch you. I must shape the corn into a phalanx that satisfies the eye watching it move, mould and round, and make it mine. In the Dylanesque heterotopia, the elements he ingests and regurgitates in the form of a pulsing poetic idiom include the things he saw and the sounds he heard. And language, Welsh and English, form part of the sonic environment that reveals itself in his work. I'm going to talk now about something quite technical, the frequency of long vowels in the work of Dylan Thomas and the matter of vowel sequences. 
So having established these things we've just spoken of, we now proceed to examine some characteristics of the Welsh Fraser line, as discernible, perhaps, in work by Dylan Thomas. The question we now ask is, to what extent do vowel sequences in many of the poet's lines reflect vowel sequences that tend to occur naturally in Welsh? And do long vowels occur in sequence with a frequency that reflects the frequency with which long vowels occur in Welsh rather than the frequency with which they occur in English? First, we need to briefly examine some of the common vowel sounds that occur in both languages. So here are some examples of short vowels in English words man, ken, sin, son, fun. In Welsh monosyllables, vowels will occur as follows mab, hen, brin, fon, mir, tan, cur. Here are examples of long or double vowels, vowel sounds in English e, keen, green, heedless, spoon, moon, soon. Here are examples of long vowels in Welsh man, tour, teen, bone. In English, certain diphthongs are long a in day and game. I in tie, oi in boy. In Welsh, the following occur a in game, I in my, oi in cloy, oi in llwy, and so on. Here now are five examples of sentences, phrases, and lines from poetry in Welsh. In each case, I translate the line. The long vowel count in both languages is given after the English translation. For instance, in the first example, the score is Welsh four long sounds, English one. We will see that in the five examples to follow, randomly chosen, 19 long vowel sounds occur in Welsh, while six occur in English. Where snails winter slumber. Hoffun gani clod a pibith. Let us sing the piper's praises. Three long vowels in Welsh, two in English. Gweddw creft heb i dawn. Craft is orphaned where talent fails. Three long vowels in Welsh, one in English. Pau by vis he boidholir. Every man nurses his own wound. Five one. In Vrith ar ddrws y stabl mae olion glaw, glawog hoi. The stable door is dotted with carvings done while waiting for a shower to pass. <coughs> Conscious now of the fact that long vowel sounds seem to occur in Welsh more often than in English, in a ratio of about three to one in the example seen above. We now consider the following examples of vowel length, frequency, and vowel sequences in the work of Dylan Thomas. Now, this first example is down the other air and the blue altered sky. Ow, o, e, u, a, i. That's the vowel sequence. Two. And down in the drifts of his need, ow i e. And the food and flames of the snow, u a o. And over the glazed lakes, o a a. Oh, there we go again. And the home of prayers and fires, o a i. As I rode to sleep, the owls were bearing the farm away. I, O, E, Ow, A, A, I. I climb to meet the war. I, E, O. And fire green as grass. I, E, A. Under the new made clouds. Eu, E, Ow. We now turn to the question of the monosyllable. 
One set of words in which long vowel sounds occur in English is the monosyllable with double E or O. In the 10 lines from Thomas above, of the 34 long vowel sounds that occur, over 20 of these occur in monosyllables, a ratio of about 2 to 3. If it be the case that the vowel patterns in Dylan Thomas's work have been influenced by vowel length and patterns in Welsh, the poet, to satisfy these patterns, will be compelled to find and use these vowels where they occur. Thus we find the nouns snow, moon, flame, and the colours blue and green. Such words as these may perform dual functions in the line, one semantic, of course, the other sonic. The seven-syllable line. In the above examples, we dealt with vowel length in accentuated or stressed syllables. Traditionally, the line of poetry in English and in other languages is characterised by the number of stresses that occur and by opposition between stressed and unstressed syllables. In Welsh and in Gaelic too, both Irish and Scottish, another system exists. In this system, the line takes its character from the number of syllables, the number of syllables that occurs, including both stressed and unstressed. In Welsh, the line composed of seven syllables occurs naturally in all periods of the tradition. Now here are five examples. This one is from the late first millennium AD, so about 1200 years ago. Na min diw, na min diw, nidois dewin. There's seven syllables. And it means, other than God, there is no new magician or conjurer. Other than God, none can create. Na min diw, nidois dewin. Gwyn a gwel of ran i chiw. Gwyn a gwel of ran i chiw. The crow thinks her own chick white. And in Irish we say, gal le shivich tu a gar cochain. A roll a ved sechet seed. A roll a ved sechet seed. Drinking will make a man thirsty. Di luch eu de degwch di. Di luch eu de degwch di. Your beauty is unblemished. Cavail blythe begail diog. Cavail blythe begail diog. A lazy shepherd is the wolf's friend. There is no doubt that the vast majority of the lines in the poetry of Dylan Thomas belong to the tradition of stressed versus unstressed syllables. But in more than one text, the tombstone told, for example, another system is at work. In this poem, there are three sets of 10 lines. Of these 30 lines, 19 have seven syllables. For example, the tombstone told when she died. Her two surnames stopped me still. A, vir a virgin married at her rest. Oh, was that eight? A virgin married. A virgin married at rest. Got it. A virgin married at rest. Okay. Moving on. The seven line syllable with Kanghanev. The naturally occurring seven line syllable in Welsh is enhanced by a rhyming system called Kanghanev or harmony. This system was codified at various junctures of the tradition. It rests on a simple principle. A line of poetry is composed of, for example, seven syllables and divided into two or three feet, separated by natural pause. The consonant sounds that occur in the first foot are repeated in the next, while the vowel sounds vary. Here are three examples. This is from the 15th century by a poet called David Nanmore. He's writing about uh, the hair of a woman called Llyw Rhyverch. Llyw Rhyverch. Llyw Rhyverch. 
eu, r, z, r, in both feet. Hair, hue of burnished gold, the hair of Llyo Rhyderch. Darn o hael, darn vol heli. This is from David ap Gwilym in the 14th century, describing a seagull, a chip of sunlight, a glove floating on the wave. This is a poem by Goronwy Owen, Ode to his beard. And he says, Di vir, oedd ceisioi do vi. To tame it, to tame it was a hopeless task. In the poem, The Tombstone Told by Dylan Thomas, we find the following three examples of seven syllable lines with Cynghanedd. With a hand plunged through her hair. Meet once on a mortal way. And I felt with my bare fall. Another poem in which we find hints of the syllabic system at work and examples of Cynghanedd like lines is When I Spoke. Here on the whole, the evidence is less compelling than in the tombstone told. However, the following lines are composed of seven syllables and show some features of Cynghanedd. Spoilers and pokers of sleep. I heard this morning waking. Dinned aside the coiling crowd. Cry my sea town was breaking. Albeit a syllable short, one line in this poem, When I Woke. Oh, here they are. One line in When I Woke reads like a simple illustration of Cynghanedd, where the consonant pattern g, d, b, d occurs in both feet. It's a strange line. He says, God in bed, good and bad. Conclusions. In this paper we have asked whether and in what ways the Welsh language may have exercised influence on the language and idiom of Dylan Thomas. Our conclusions are as follows. Lexical borrowing from Welsh is rare. The syntax of the poet's language is not derived from Welsh. There is, however, evidence to suggest that Welsh, through the frequency of its long vowel sounds and through the vowel sequences typical of the language, Welsh did leave its mark on vowel sequences in the work of Dylan Thomas, thus influencing his choice of word and ultimately the development of his poetic lexicon. Finally, occasional examples of the seven-syllable line, some with Cynghanedd, seem to suggest that, perhaps, though perhaps not entirely subconsciously, Dylan Thomas did introduce into his work lines structurally more typical of Welsh than of English. This is a minor uh, thing, but not entirely insignificant. Uh, further work is required to qualify these four observations. For example, we need to describe in correct detail vowel length in both languages, the frequency with which long vowels occur in both languages, and the vowel sequences that tend to occur in Welsh. Also, we need to apply the above, the above to a much bigger sample of Dylan Thomas's writing, if not to the entire corpus. However, work on the sample chosen has yielded interesting evidence, and my intuition encourages me to accept with confidence the plausibility of the four conclusions as formulated above. Ultimately, these things can perhaps or not be demonstrated by statistics, but knowledge of them will lie not in the numbers, but in the voice, the Welsh voice, that a speaker of Welsh may hear, albeit distant and faint at times, in the writing of Dylan Thomas as he sings in his chains like the sea. <laughs> <laughs>